The estate tax material can be found in Chapter 4 of the Farm Transition Workbook. This session will cover estate tax laws that are in effect for deaths occurring during 2015. We will look at both federal and Oklahoma estate and gift tax rules that do apply. So, first thing, taxing the estate. One thing to keep in mind, Oklahoma estate tax law has been repealed permanently beginning January 1 of 2010. So since that time, Oklahoma has not had an estate tax. The federal state estate tax laws still do apply. One thing to keep in mind, estate taxes are levied on the estate and not on the recipients of the assets. So levied on the estate, not the recipients. Current law. The federal estate tax exemption is currently set at $5.43 million of fair market value of assets in, the individual's, in, a, in an individual's estate. The maximum tax rate as of right now is 40%. It's applied to the amount of the estate that exceeds that $5.43 million. One thing to keep in mind, once we pass and we ask, our assets are passed into an estate, they receive a step up to market value at date of death basis. So no matter what they were valued at prior to that time, once they go into the estate, they are stepped up to market value at the date of death. The exemption then at 5.43 million is applied to that. So the exemption, keep in mind, is indexed for inflation annually. Also, a surviving spouse can use the deceased spouse unused estate tax exemption. This is called portability. We'll talk more of that later on. But if you look at it, basically that allows a husband and wife at the present time to pass $10.86 million of assets to the heirs free of estate taxes. So here's an example of portability. A husband passes in 2011. The value of the estate at that time was 400 or four million two hundred fifty thousand. There is an unused amount then at that point in time of seven hundred fifty thousand because the estate tax exemption in 2011 was five million dollars. So in 2015, the wife passes. The fair market value of the estate, her estate is now six million. Since her or the husband did not use up that last 750000 the wife can now apply that. So we can take the 5.43, add to that the unused amount. We're going to use 570000 of that from the husband. That allows us then to pass the $6 million free of estate taxes. So what if the wife remarries? This creates some issues. Surviving spouse remarries, what happens? Well, if she survives her second husband, she can then have access to the lesser of the basic 5.43 million exclusion or husband number two's unused exclusion. Husband number one's goes away. So if her second husband doesn't fully use his exclusion, she has access to that. If she predeceases husband number two, then he has access to any of her unused exemption, which also includes that from husband number one that was unused. So he gets the best of both worlds. So how do you transfer the unused exemption? Well, it is not automatic. The executor of the estate must make the election to transfer it on a timely filed estate tax return. So it has to be made on an estate tax return. Then it can be used to offset future increase in value of the estate when the surviving spouses pass or the offset of a lifetime taxable gift should the surviving spouse want to make those at a later date. So it can still be used, pass forward, but it is not automatic. So what makes up the taxable estate? Well, the taxable estate basically equals the value of all property owned and controlled by the decedent, less any allowable deductions. So the gross estate, that's the value of those assets. What is going to include? Total real and personal property. So real estate, land, etc. Plus any personal property. Machinery, cattle, equipment, 
items that we own personally, our own our shotguns, etc., would be included in that. And controlled by the decedent also. So if the decedent had created a trust and put everything in there, he still has control of those assets. They are still considered owned by the decedent. The same thing would be a, the, a situation of life insurance. If the life insurance is owned by the decedent, but name somebody else a beneficiary, that is considered owned and controlled. Consequently, that is also included in the decedent's estate. Also include full value of property owned in joint tenancy, except that owned with a spouse. Spouses are immediately assumed to own half and half, or have purchased half and half. So it's half in the wife's estate, half in the husband's estate. If it is not joint tenancy with husband and wife, then we have to prove who did make contribution to the purchase of those assets. So if the decedent purchased 90%, then 90% is going to be in his estate, 10% in the other person's estate. If they had 100% ownership or purchase of that asset, then 100% is going to be in the estate. So you have to look at who contributed to the per 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 purchase and to what extent that was done. So, like I said, one half of the value of joint tenancy holdings with a spouse. Insurance controlled, owned or controlled by the decedent, as we just talked about. If it's owned and controlled, it's included. If it is not owned, if it's owned by the surviving spouse, then it's not included. Any taxable portions of gifts that have been made in prior years are going to be included in the tax base, but later adjusted for gift taxes paid. So you don't lose it even though the gift tax was included at an earlier time. You just have to go through a calculation to make adjustments for those taxes, gift taxes that were paid. Other property. Property, like I said, transferred to revocable living trust. If it pays all the income to the decedent, or can be directed by the decedent, is treated as owned by the decedent. If we simply have a power of appointment, so I give my wife power of appointment to transfer my property. She does not own it. She just has the power to determine who gets it at a later date. Then it would not be considered in her asset base, but it would be considered, is considered in mine. So what's the value of the assets? Well, it's the fair market value at date of death. So you look at the date of death, you appraise all the property at that point, see what its fair market value is, and that becomes the basis for the estate valuation. However, there is an alternate valuation date. It can be any time during six months after date of death, where we have to look at the gross value of the estate. It, the gross value had to have declined. So the total value of the estate had to have declined to use the alternate valuation date, that being six months after date of death. So if the economy falls, like it did during the Great Depression of the, th the 20s, consequently, then we would probably see a situation where an alternate valuation date would be allowed. Most of the time, this does not work. Current use valuation is another way of pre producing a value to the, uh, the estate. We have to look at closely held business assets, so it's farm or other closely held business, family business. Current use valuation is then what it's worth in or as a business, not as the value of the property that's there. Current use valuation, well, the executor of the estate has to make the election. It may be elected if a farm or other closely held business assets comprise at least 50% of the adjusted gross estate. So you've got to look at it. If it's a major asset, the business is a major asset in the estate, we can probably use current use valuation. Also required, 25% of that value has to be farm real estate, farmland, cropland, pasture land. Has to pass to a qualified heir. Now qualified heir basically is one that's going to be, have continue farming that for the next few years. One of the requirements is it had to be held as a farm by the decedent or member of the family five out of the pre previous eight years. And it, 
This is where it comes back to the decedent and member of a decedent's family has to have maturely participated in that business for those five out of eight years. So it could have been rented once or twice during those eight years, but material participation needs to be looked at. Also, one other requirement is that the valuation does not reduce the estate by more than $1.1 million in 2015. This number is also adjusted annually for inflation. So the $1.1 million will be high, will only holds for 2015. It will be greater in 2016. So how is it computed? Well, current use value looks at what it rents for. So that would be the real estate, less any real estate taxes. You then look at current interest rate, and then that will equal the current use valuation. So what's this imply? So if you look at land that rents for $50 an acre, the taxes on that comes out to about $3 an acre. If the current interest rate is about 5.15%, then that ends up being $900 an acre approximately. So 160 acres, $146,000. If you look at what this piece of property would actually have sold for, it would very well be in the thousand or the two thousand dollar range so consequently you can see that this is a major tax savings now the fun part of using current use valuation is that if something happens at a later date for example if a property passes to a non-family member or it ceases to be used for farming or if it's a other small business if it's not used for that business purpose as well then recapture does occur so the recapture that tax savings gets passed back it gets applied to the person that operates it the heir not to the estate so let's look at the federal allowable deductions we have an estate tax credit that being that number we talked about earlier 5.43 million a marital deduction that's property that passes to a surviving spouse through marriage so that amount can be done Transfers to exempt charities, religious, similar institutions is also allowed as a deduction. Any claims against the estate, those being debts on the land, etc., any administrative costs, funeral expenses, any unpaid taxes, those items are also allowed to be deducted from that gross value. So remember what the estate tax exemption amount is, that credit, that's $5.43 million. 40% maximum tax rate for 2015. That exemption amount is adjusted annually for inflation. So watch next year, see where that number is. It does get adjusted. Now it's a marital deduction. It applies to marital gifts or transfers. So a husband and wife, they can move money, property, etc. around. He can gift things to his wife. She can gift things back to her husband. And that does not create a tax situation. No gift tax. Marital gifts, one way of thinking about this, if I own an insurance, my, a life insurance policy on myself, and I don't want that included in my estate, I can gift that life insurance policy to my wife. Now she becomes the owner. I being the insured, she being the beneficiary, it's not included in my estate. That allows us then to avoid some estate tax issues on those valuations. The marital deduction is not limited. You can give your spouse as much property as you want to, even if it exceeds that $5.43 million. doesn't matter. So gifts, gift taxes, gifting away property. The gift tax rules as they apply on the federal level, currently a person can give $14,000 per year per person and not pay any gift taxes. Now the gift tax is levied on the giver, not the receiver. Husband and wife, by splitting gifts, can give $28,000 per year to as many people as they wish. So if we have three children, husband and wife can give each one of those children $28,000 and not pay any gift tax on that. If we decide we want to give more than $28,000, Let's say we wanted to give each child 50000 Then we would apply the excess against our unified tax credit at 5.43 to offset any gift taxes due. So essentially what it does is it reduces the future size 
of the unified credit by the amount that exceeds the 28000 husband and wife amount. So the same thing would apply if you gave a child as an individual 20000 you pay $6,000 of 6000 would be applied to the gift tax, even though no gift tax would actually be paid, it would reduce the unified credit by $6,000. Gift taxes, like income taxes, that return is due April 15th of that year. Oklahoma, well, they did away with gift taxes a long time ago, so there's no gift tax, no estate tax in Oklahoma. Makes life very simple. Important note, without an Oklahoma estate tax and that $5.43 million federal estate tax exclusion, there's been a lot of rumors, a lot of discussion, well, you don't need to file a return, you don't need to do anything. Uh, that's kind of a misnomer. Wrong assumption, especially if you want to make sure that we elect the portability, we have to file an estate tax return. And if we want to transfer ownership to heirs and beneficiaries, we have to go through a probate process of some way, shape, or form. That is to allow us to get title transferred. So you still have to go through a process of getting titles transferred. You want to make sure that a uh, state tax return is filed if we want to maintain the portability election. So some general principles to think about. One thing to make sure we do is avoid subjecting the total estate to estate taxes and other estate settlement costs more than once in a large estate. Now what do we call a large estate? That's something that's going to be in excess of the unified credit at $5.43 million. So a husband and wife really looking at this thing, that'd be about five point or ten point eight six million would constitute us getting to a large estate. In that scenario, we would want to do some good planning, make sure that we do not mess up, subject the estate to taxes. To develop the best plan, we have to look at the estate settlement costs. That includes the estate taxes, probate, etc. Has to be looked at from both spouses to make sure that we do a good job of managing all those costs and keep them to a minimum. Also, it is important to take wise and good use of the marital deduction. But simply maximizing the marital deduction does not always reduce our state settlement costs. It can help, though. It's wise to seek good tax and legal advice when we start looking at our estate to make sure that we are doing things right. Current use valuation. Well, it can be done, but you really have to think about what are we looking at those assets being used for in the future. If we've got an heir and that heir is more than likely going to be farming that property for the next 8 to 10 years, longer, then current use value very well could be a benefit. If there is a chance that something could go wrong, current use valuation may not help us any. So you really got to look at that, watch what's going on. It may not be as good a deal as you'd think. All parents should retain enough assets to live comfortably and take care of any emergencies. You don't want any surprises that come up and now we can't take care of them. So make sure you retain enough of the assets to take care of those emergencies and make sure that we don't put ourselves into a hardship situation. State planning, well, there is no such thing as a one plan fits all. It's going to be different for each family, each individual, each farm business. Another thing, each plan or a good plan will change over time because no matter what happens, estates change, family situations change. Grandchildren are born, children get married, etc. We have to make sure we have some flexibility in our estate plan to cover that. So like I said, no one correct answer exists. It's different for everyone. Things change. Federal tax laws will change. Marital statuses will change. Grandchildren born, etc. Have to be aware of the federal estate tax rules. These things change as well. Do not subject that to estate taxes more than once. If you've done a good job of estate planning, we will minimize estate settlement costs, that being estate taxes 
all probate costs, all other settlement costs as well. So in review, what we've done is discuss the basic federal estate and gift tax rules. Like I said, Oklahoma repealed their estate tax, also repealed their gift tax. The portability of an estate tax exemption, we have to look at it, has to be elected on the timely filed estate tax return. It has some benefits. Those should be weighed as well. So for more information, look in the workbook. You can also go to the Farm Transitions website. There's more videos located there. But there's also a more detailed discussion of this presentation that can be found in the workbook. So with that, we'll close this session.